Welcome to Power Fridays Live, a channel that aims to make a difference in the world through transformation, spiritual growth, and for entrepreneurs. Our vision is to empower individuals to live their lives with purpose and to make a positive impact on the world. We believe that power and purpose are the driving forces behind success and fulfillment in both personal You're muted. Oh, man, they got me again with the muted. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Power Fridays Live. I'm sitting in for Janelle Pulley. I'm here with my partner, Mr. Elroy Jones. And we're supposed to have a special guest on tonight. And I look forward to asking them some powerful questions. Um, so in the meantime and in between time, let's get into this. What we... What, what, what we're going to be talking about tonight is um, acquisitions, right? And there, there's there's a couple types of acquisitions, right? Um, there's the asset purchase, right? And acquiring specific asset of a targeted company. Um, there's stock purchase, buying the shares of that targeted company, right? Sometimes uh, call a hostile takeover. Um, and merges, combining two companies to form a new entity. What do you think about that, Elroy? Oh, I think it's great. Um, merges and acquisitions is uh, big boy stuff. <laughs> we see that uh, in the movies they make about it. Arbitrage. Yeah. Uh, Pretty Woman, they, they, they popularized yeah. it with um, Richard Gere and what's her name? Uh, name name. Lady name. Yeah. I know you talking about, though. Right. I forgot her name. So you have you, you, you have this, this whole fantasy image of this uh, great business person coming in and, and saving a company. Uh, and um, that's kind of what the person we're talking to today, uh, when he gets here. Yeah, that's what you have is. Absolutely. Didn't they didn't Eddie Murphy had a movie? What was that movie? Eddie Murphy had a movie where they was buying stocks off for of the stock market too. Was that an acquisition? Trading places. Trading places. Trading places, yes. Right? Yeah. That was a, that was a form. It was buying mm -hmm. futures on mm -hmm. the futures market and um uh they got a tip and the whole thing was about how the you know the the futures market works and if you can get in early i think they did a um oh man we use the uh Brokerage money, not your own, to buy. They use right. the brokerage money. Why can't I remember what you call that? And uh, they, um, they, they lost. Uh, they lost gold. And they had to um, put up the money. They had to pay the company. because They, they use margins. Margins. Yes, why can't I remember that? So, the the stock market is uh, a monster. There's a lot of stuff going on there, and mergers and acquisitions. A lot of times, that's for uh, a company that is uh, publicly traded or even privately traded. Uh, so, you get a lot of regulations as to merging or acquiring a company that's um, publicly traded. So I'm sure we'll touch on a little bit of that, but there's, there's so much, you know, and and um, since we have a little bit of time. Yeah, Javar, I just spoke with Javar. He's hopping on in a second. But um, one of the reasons for, um, when you're thinking about an acquisition, one of the things, 
we look at is what is the motivation for the acquisition, right? There's usually five types of motivation, the strategic expansion, right? Where you enter in new markets and expanding product service offerings. Um, there is the market share. My guy, Javar, just pull up. We're going to add him to the stage. There you go. And um, he, he, he'll be coming in soon. Give him a second. There you go. There you go, my guy. Javar, how you doing, man? Welcome to Power Fridays Live. Can you hear me? Looks like he's frozen. I think he might be frozen. Oh. I think he. I'm, I'm outstanding. Hold on one second. It's kind of choppy where I'm at. I may have to change load. Absolutely. So another reason is market share, right? Um, increasing market presence and competitiveness. Um, cost synergy, right? Achieving cost efficiency through economics of scaling. And um, sometimes it's talent acquisition, gain access to skilled personnel, and then technology access, obtaining new technology or intellectual property. Jabal, we got you? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you loud and clear, bro. How you doing, man? Happy holidays. Oh, man, I'm outstanding. Yeah, likewise, I'm outstanding, but always improving. How you doing, Devon and Elroy? Good to see you, brother. Blessed to have you, you with us, man. The year almost about to end. Tomorrow is Small Business Saturdays. But uh, you was trying to bring up the topic of acquisitions because we know you're the, the go-to guy for acquisitions. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, give everybody your story, and then we'll jump into it. Yeah, no. So so thanks for having me. My name is Jafar Avery. I am the president of Sun Moon Capital Partners. We are a uh, private equity firm that uh, you know deals in lower middle market buyouts. Typically, we call them micro middle market buyouts. So those are companies typically one to two million to EBDA, mainly focusing on kind of the South region, more Southwest, uh, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, things like that. Um, and, and you know, been doing that for, for a while. Started with a small family owned coffee shop that we acquired back in Hampton, Virginia, which I'm from Virginia. Um, and then from there, the love of doing deals just kind of, I couldn't stop it. You know, again, just kept reading and learning about it. And before you know it, you know, now we're in the process of raising our inaugural fund of $20 million. We've done uh, another deal in the toxicology space. And, um, you know, just just guys, you know, figuring it out along the journey. And that's that's a little bit about me and, and about Sun and Moon Capital. Awesome. Sorry, I was muted there. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, Javar, um, your journey from or in a coffee shop to being the president of Sunny Moon Capital is truly remarkable. Can you tell us back in the early days, um, can you share a pivotal moment uh, that set the stage for your success in the world of yeah. this position? Yeah, you know, whether I'm successful or not, that's that's subjective. But 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 what I will say is, yeah, it was it was so I I think it was at South University. And I don't know if I ended up in a finance class that talked about different types of assets and all those kind of things. And the topic of M&A came up and that was intriguing to me out of everything. And then from there, I actually didn't finish my college journey there, um, but I was so intrigued by this idea of M&A that after that, so that was the pivotal point. But then I just started reading and reading and reading as much as I could. And I would visit like the libraries at libraries at some of the, you know, public colleges. And I would just continue to learn, 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 learn. And then I just told my wife one day. And then, of course, everybody talks about Reginald Lewis. And, and I did get a hold of, you know, Reginald Lewis's book. And that was also some inspiration to see someone of color do it. Now, now, people like to talk about Reggie, but they don't really take into account all of the aspects that Reggie was able to leverage. There was so many things that Reggie had working in his favor that we don't have today, honestly, as African-Americans, um, 
that also allowed him to do that. Um, and so I, I, I get the, the idea of saying Reginald Lewis, and he's, he's phenomenal. He's one of my, a person that I was originally intrigued by in his book. But um, there were a lot of things, and we could discuss that some other time, a lot of things that helped him as well on his journey. Um, and so, yeah, so then I started reading a lot. And then I just finally said, told my wife, I just said, forget this. I'm, I'm going to go try this. And I had no idea, like, how to do it. <laughs> like, I'm not even lying to you. Other than reading books, like, my route to this is non-traditional, right? Most of people's mm-hmm. route to this is I went to business school. I went to Harvard. I went to Warren. Like, you look at a lot of people in this space. They got these. I, I, I was an intern at Goldman Sachs, and I, did, I didn't do any of that stuff. You know, I just was like, I'm going to try this. And then once we acquired the coffee shop, the original idea of a coffee shop wasn't even to acquire it. It was really... I was trying to convince this guy to let me have access to the books and all these things because I wanted to learn how to value, right? I wanted to learn how to value this asset. Mm -hmm. And uh, what ultimately happened is I placed a value that I figured I could raise money on. And if I could do it, if I could, if he said yes, then we would do it. Um, Led to a failure in that first location, second location that had its own issues that Mm-hmm. But that those were that that was the impetus to this whole thing. And then once the coffee shops, uh, once we did that, I learned what not to do. I learned what type of team I needed to have, and that's when I began developing, right? Developing teams, developing all that stuff. And then um, we became shareholders in the toxicology lab, which was more, which was essentially the second opportunity um, that we jumped into. But that was a, a more of a middle market business. Uh, and then from there, man, it was just kind of like deals here, deals there, deals die. We would raise money, you know, for whatever reason, the deal didn't close. Well, I mean, it's all kind of stuff that happens in this business. But to answer your main question, it was it was sitting in a, a class that helped me realize that this existed. And then from there, I just took it and, you know, ran with it. Yeah, that's good. That's real good, because I love to say there's no such thing as failure. There's only lessons, right? Because that's right. That's right. You could either choose to learn from it or you could choose to let it slow you down. Those are your two That's right. options. That's right. You know That's right. I mean? So That's right. I'm happy. I'm happy to have you on, brother, and sharing these uh these nuggets. Elroy, any questions? Uh no, I, I just um remember some of the things that uh Jafar was talking about that I um experienced as well. Reginald Lewis is definitely one of my heroes. I mean, the amazing things that he did and the the focus, the attention that he brought to his business, that he uh, joined the firm when he came out of Harvard and learned, stayed there for a couple of years, and then got his own company, but still he was working for other people, uh, learning how to make mergers and acquisitions for clients. And I think he did that for 10 or 15 years before he actually came out on his own with his own investment company. So that's, that's, that's a great story. And I, uh, I appreciate you going in uh, to this business because there's some questions I have that I'll, I'll ask as we go on. Thank you. Yeah. And, and, and if you don't mind, this is so Reggie. I've actually talked to his brother, um, his brother, uh, Gene. Gene is his brother. I have actually had a chance to talk to him to learn a little bit more about Reggie. I, I, I was close to having a conversation with his daughter because I, I think there needs to be some sort of biopic made about him. Right. But what I want people to understand about Reggie's story real quick is that there were a lot of things Reggie did. Reggie come from an underserved community just like me. Reggie went to and he did his Harvard thing. But there were things that were, you know, back in those days called mesbics, right? Mesbics that no longer exist today. That Reggie, and it's not anything that has to do with him, but he was able to leverage that mesbic. We don't have a mesbic today where I can go leverage. That's number one. Number two, uh, Michael Milken played a big part in his. And I know a couple of other minority PE folks that Michael Milton, Milken played a big part in their in their journey. So Michael Milken was a big part of that. Um and number three, Gene. Gene was an NFL guy. So when he needed the equity, think about what you and I got to go to the equity. We don't have an NFL brother, right? right. That, that we, so, 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 yes, not, not, 
he all credit due to Reggie, right? He had the ambition, he had the drive, but there were also some components that helped Reggie on the journey. So now here we are today. I don't have a gene, right? A brother that can help me with my equity, right? Like right. that. And and I don't have a Michael Milken and there's no longer a Mesbit. So how do we as African Americans navigate that this journey now? That's that's what that's what we talk. That's what I like talking about sometimes. Yeah. And I think that's what I like about your stories. Like you said earlier, you didn't do it the traditional way. You found a different way to get into the space. And if you could share a little bit more about how complex or not complex that was for you to get into space, because if, if if I remember right, your your entry wasn't from having a big company and buying another company. Your entry was right. just straight in. So talk to us. Yeah, it was. So it wasn't, so it's more complex now, right? right? The more sophisticated you get, the more complex it becomes. But yeah, but as you get better at it, right? It gets less and less complex. When mm -hmm. I first started as just an entrepreneur, like it was, it, it, it was just like, just go do it, right? And then you lose your shirt a little bit and then you learn. But now it's a little more complex. Like for instance, we're, we're, we're in the process of raising our inaugural fund of about 20 million. We may have to bump it up because some of the, some of our LPs, you know, that we're targeting want to write bigger checks, but you begin to learn now it's more about, okay, the executive terms, are they buttoned up? The LPA agreement, is that buttoned up? All that stuff didn't exist at first, right? Yeah. All that stuff didn't exist. So then it becomes a little more complex. Dealing with the people becomes a little more complex. I didn't have to deal with all those people at first, but uh, so the complexity is when I first started, it it should have been that complex. Let me tell you that much. It should have been. I just didn't know, right? I had no clue. I had no idea. The complexity that that is there now, I understand why it's more complex. I understand why it's there. There there are so many things. It's like a checks and balances thing, right? I had no checks and balances when I first started. Now I've got a massive checks and balances that 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 does a couple of things. Number one, if you lose those checks and balances, help you know help you overcome that right because mm -hmm. you saw the opportunity just like i saw it you presented it you you heard me presented it and you accepted it so there there was those natural checks and balances versus when you don't have that and you're just out there just kind of you know in the wind then you know it's hard to make everyone accountable for for what's going on and so a little more complex now but i i, I love it that way i love it that way i think i think the complexity Honestly, sometimes I think things are complex by design to keep certain to keep people from trying to, you know, yeah, navigate these. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and and also you know to keep people from trying to like jump in it, right? right? Because it is so complex, right? People are like ah, I don't want to. You you think about this for a second. How easy is it to pick up your phone and start a YouTube channel? Mm -hmm. It's like you do that in like yeah. No time. There's no complexity to it. So everybody rushes to that. Mm -hmm. How easy is it to go and raise 100 million or 20 million or even just, you know, get a deal across the finish line? It's mm -hmm. very, very complex. And mm -hmm. so people don't want to deal with that complexity. But man, within that complexity, I promise you, dude, you learn so much, you figure it out. And then it's like the greatest thing in the world when, they, when you get it done. So anyway, yeah, so there's two lessons there, right? There's the first lesson where you need to tap. If you're thinking about doing something, you need to take action now because things happen throughout time that change the landscape of how things can be done, right? That's so, right. That's right. Yeah, so just like when um back in twenty um two thousand and eight with the with the real estate market, when when all those mortgage subprime mortgage ha or whatever happened. They went in and they changed the game, right? They try to make it more difficult for you just to, for them to just be giving away mortgages. So for those people who would have took advantage before that, if they knew what they were doing or at least did it um, uh, strategically, they they would have been all right, right? Because you would have had tenants paying the rent, and and that was that. But there's also the part that the second lesson is. Um, sometimes they change stuff and it becomes easier, right? So, um, there's like two lessons there because 
just like you said with with technology right technology in the beginning is expensive for technology but as they master the making of the product or service that price comes down making it easier for you to have access to it right so there, there's two really great lessons there no oh, absolutely absolutely and, and i tell people all the time what i learned is where the complexity is that's typically where the money is yeah. <laughs> it's more, the more complex and i learned this all day, the more complex it is yeah that's where the money is man because if you can figure it out Mm -hmm. Right. You, you know, you, you strike gold. Right. And then, you, you, you know, you can you kind of can duplicate that and repeat that. Right. I mean, you think about how complex an, an acquisition is. I mean, let's just talk about it real quick. Right. So first, we got to find an opportunity. Well, well, geez, you got to go out and do marketing. That's marketing. Mm -hmm. Right. You have to market your firm to bankers, brokers, accounts. I spent two years just marketing, you know, telling the world who we are. So now my inbox it's just kind of filling up with deals, right? And and then guess what? Well, then you got to filter through those deals, right? This is time now. This is time. You got to filter through those deals to find an opportunity that fits. Well, guess what? The same deal that got sent to you got sent to every company just like you. Right. So they're <laughs> so now, filtering through too. Now your competition so now, fighting bingo. the thing you found. <laughs> bingo. Bingo, right? So right. now we got more complexity to it. Now I've got to now battle against this other group that, that, that by the way, Devon and Elroy may have the money in their bank account. You see what I mean? Right. So now that's another, uh, that's another thing. That's another piece of complexity, right? Um, the, the point that I'm making is there's so much complexity that I guess if you don't enjoy it, like I do, you're not passionate about it. It may be easy to give up because you're going to, you're going to battle all that. You're going to battle all of that, man. I promise you. You know, you just reminded me of something one of my mentors used to say in real estate. He used to say, what's your unique advantage, right? Yep. What, yep. What, what's, what's your upper hand that the competition don't have? Do you have a brother that does construction so you don't have to pay full price? Do you have somebody with access to sunset? Because all that comes into the offer that you make for the house. Because if you... If you have certain advantages, you can make a better offer than the competition. You may be able to make a higher offer because your expense. And he even went into tax. You know, look at how you paying tax. You know what I'm saying? Because of how you paying tax, the push, because of how you may be de depreciating the property, then you may be able to say, I could pay this much more for the property than um than so these little. I Things is very important. That's a good point. That's right. That's right. That is absolutely correct. And we try our best to be. That's why we play in the, what we call the micro market, right? The micro mm -hmm. market is like I say that one or two million of EBITDA. You're, you're, you're to, to us. We so we invest around a theme, and the theme is the underserved capital markets, and they kind of fit that theme. And so, um, yeah, man, we try to we try our best to be differentiated in that regards, and then differentiated with with us being minorities. And then we, you know, we try to leverage some of those things. But all in all, it's, it's a tough business. Uh, I, I always like to say, and, and I do believe that the capital is a ton of capital out there in the market. It's just so much capital chasing too few opportunities. And that's typically, you know, the issue. So you got to find a way to, you know, get those opportunities no one else is, are looking at, is looking at. So once you get the opportunity, once you found this opportunity, what's next? Oh man! So you find it. So we, so I have an analyst. Our me and my analyst will have a weekly call. Say, you know, these are the deals in the pipeline. We have our CRM. But these are the pipeline. These are the ones we like, don't like. Uh, our process, and and it's typically standard. It may be standard. Our process is now more like a a broker. We call whoever if it's a broker representing it. Now we get a call with the broker to understand like. Are there any valuation expectations, right? Because the last thing we want to do is, is have some sellers say, I want, you know, seven times, you know, for the business. And we're like, ah, we're out, right? So, so, so that's, I'm glad you asked me that. Because there's another piece to this whole thing. You can, you can, you know, a deal can die right there, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, we're not going to pay seven times. We'll see you, you know. And my theory on, on valuation is this. We don't lowball, but we also are not in trying to pay premiums 
right. for opportunities. If you right. want a premium, right, the market, we typically, my mentor told me this long time ago, I used to get frustrated by these high valuation multiples. And he said, you know what, Javar? He said, let the market, you know, everybody, it's kind of like that whole uh, uh, Mike Tyson thing. Everybody is confident to know that they want to, they get punched in the mouth or something. He said, yeah, yeah, it's, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's the same thing in this world. Everybody wants to, you know, I want 8 million, 9 million, 10 million. And then the market says, no, we'll give you five, mm -hmm. right? And so right. it's the same concept. You sit back and you let the market tell them what their business is worth. So anyway, so, you know, it's it's uh, a call with the broker or banker to understand kind of those things. What is management expectations or what are management expectations? Are they staying in the business, leaving the business, all that kind of stuff? Um, then from there, we internally, you take that and we say, okay, this is something interesting. It fits. It checks most, most of the boxes. Then we try to get a call with management, right? We get a call with management. We had a broker set up a call with management because we want to get to know them. They get to know us. Then we, depending on the location, we take a site visit, right? We kick the tires. There's nothing like face-to-face, eye-to-eye, right? And, and getting a feel for, for things, right? Um, from there, if all goes well, then we go IOI. We go IOI. So our IOI is just an indication of interest. And we typically will offer a range. Now, remember, our offer is based on uh a high level model right where we're kind of saying we know you know if we offer this between this we can actually get this much leverage you know and if we grow it at five percent ten percent we can do you know we've already kind of established what we think from a high level before right. we make the offer right and so and if the offer is in range and you know then we move to a loi they accept the loi LOI is usually 90 days. Now you got 90 days to try to now. Now I will say this before we typically, and, and this is an, this is an idea for every, and anyone listening or anyone's going to watch later. Yeah. You can always, you can always get the capital partners to support you pre LOI. So what I typically, so, so, okay. So it's an interesting dynamic. I hope you follow and follow me with this. It's an interesting right. dynamic here mm -hmm. because Yes, there aren't a ton of deals, but remember I told you there's a ton of capital. So right. all these banks, all these commercial lenders, they got all this capital, right? So they're competing against other banks for my deal, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so what I do is I say, hey, Mr. Banker, Sunflower, SunTrust, whatever, you want this opportunity? I need you to help me get the LOI done. Here's how you help me. You give me a letter of support. You give me a letter of support saying that we support Sun and Moon Capital Partners for 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 you know seven million dollars to complete this acquisition now it's not a guarantee and 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 that's fine right you're just looking for a letter of support from a bank from an institution that knows what they're doing and that's what we typically ask for so if i ever run into an issue where that where an owner until we raise our fund i won't have this issue but where a, a owner is saying hey show us give us some kind of proof you can get some capital I go right to my, and that's the power of having those partners. I go mm -hmm. right to the senior lender and say, hey, you want to do this deal? You ain't on this deal? Okay, look, I know it's high level. I need a letter, a letter of support. They'll do it all day long. They'll do it all day long, right? Because they, they want the deal. So here's the question, right? When you, to get the letter of support, what are they, what do they require? Do they require any asset to back anything or they, or just the all relationship? Great question. So at some point, you hope just to get it down in a relationship, but there's always an underwriting process, right? Uh, depending on what kind of loan you're going after, right? So if you're going after, you know, uh, uh, ABL, yeah, you, you, that's asset, right? They're going to want to see the assets and things like that. They don't have to, they can still, uh, uh, a lot of it is based on EBITDA terms. Mm -hmm. Let me just tell you that. So for instance, like right now, a bank will give you two terms. Let's just say cash flow. Let's not say EBITDA. Let's just say cash flow. Right now, a bank may give you two times of debt on the cash flow. So if you got a million dollars worth of cash flow, they give you two times, right? If you got two million dollars worth of cash flow, they give you two times. So we typically model everything off of that, right? That we know a bank will give us roughly two terms of, of cash flow, right? Um, and so if it's two million dollar business, we can get at least, you know, four million dollars or whatever it is, right? From from a bank. Um, now, where they want to see some, is it depends. If it's cash flow based, then no. They just going straight off the cash flow, right? But we're typically getting more of a unitron loan where it has some 
asset-based lending in there, some senior lending in there, some meds lending, right? It's all in kind of one package. Um, but uh, they don't really need to see much. They need to, what they need to see is the business, the numbers. They need to understand, again, this is high level, right? right, they're, right. They're, they're just trying to help you get the deal, you know, to the, to the next stage. And in return, they want you to, you know, say, yes, I'll work with you. You work with me. They give us the letter of support. But we've already come to the table with us. Uh, we already got the, the sources and uses and everything that they need to see and how mm -hmm. much we're looking for to get right. this done. And right. then they give us a high level letter of support. And then if we can get to an LOI, now is when the real due diligence starts. And they begin to start saying, OK, let's really dig in and see what we have. Because but this is a great part of the conversation, because what people need to realize is that. Just because we get the LOI, we may get in there and find something that blows the whole thing up. Right. You still, diligence starts then. Right. So, so anyway, so I wouldn't say that they necessarily need to see. They need to see your. They need to kind of see your high level model and thinking. Right. Uh, and we have a process that gets us there, so they can get comfortable writing us a letter of support. And do they look at? They look. They kind of. If I understand you correctly, they kind of look at the company you're acquiring more than your personal assets or whatever, right? Absolutely. Let me tell you something, man. I said this before to you guys. Look here, man. When we raised that, we raised like $7 million from some from Sunflower, $8 million, it was something like that. And then we raised a couple. We raised a little bit more money from uh, Sun SunTrust and one with Sunflower. Mm -hmm. And my personal had nothing to do with it. Actually, my credit was jacked up. My credit still, my credit still is not the best. Like I, I, that's why I love doing this because I'm like, if, if we if we've been like, be, if I'm here to be candid, so people can like say, oh, I cannot have a lot of money in the bank. Yeah, but again, it's complex, right? Mm -hmm. The complexity is what's going to keep you out. But if you can get through the complexity, absolutely, you can. Have, you don't have to have any money in the bank. You don't have to look. There's so many ways to skin a cat in this business. You don't have to have a dime. <laughs> you don't have to have a dime. But you have to know how to skin the cat. Exactly. You know, it's funny because my dad, back in the days, they used to have this thing called a club they used to put on cars. And uh -huh. my dad would put the club on the car every night. So uh, I'd be like, dad, does that really work? He's like, this club right here is just to keep away the, the troublemakers, right? Uh -huh. um, he said, the real thieves? They're gonna come prepared. Right. <laughs> cut that, that. They're gonna go with equipment to cut that off. So this club right. ain't gonna do nothing. That's right. So That's right. I say that to say, you know, the complexity of it, it keeps away the tr troublemakers, right? But yeah. the real people that want to close the deal, the real people that want to do business, they're gonna come prepared, like you roll, like you said, we're prepared. We already have it together. You know what I That's mean? That's right. So That's right. That's, That's right. Good That's right. And it takes time to get it takes time to get to that preparedness, right? It doesn't happen overnight. Uh it took me a lot of time. The the people that I sit with now, the money I'm raising now, it took some time to get to that level. Mm -hmm. Didn't happen overnight, right? And so the good news is I found what I wanted to do in my 30s, uh probably mid-20s, because I we started a journey mid-20s, and, and I'm 39 now. Mm -hmm. And I spent my 30s just building this thing. And now, and we've closed the deal and we've done some some stuff, mm -hmm. but now in my 40s, we're getting ready to, this thing is about to, we begin getting ready to start earning like crazy. Then I'll be able to help people out, hopefully, on the journey, so. Nice. Uh, Roy, you wanted to say something? I think I saw your mouth moving. <laughs> you muted. Okay, there you, know, you go. I, I remembered um, that you had, you were doing a deal a couple of months back with a uh, furniture company? No, not furniture. Um, flooring company. Yeah, it was a flooring. That's right. Flooring company. Uh, what happened with that? that so that deal ended up. That, that deal ended up dying on us. Uh, what happened to that deal? We needed like one point eight million to close that thing. We raised a million. I had so much structure in the damn thing, and I tried to get the owners to structure some more with me. But they wouldn't, and um, was you know was this the one with the family, family? Yeah, 
Okay. Yeah, it's family owned. Yeah, most of our stuff is, is family owned, and mm-hmm. and that's what, that's the reason I like that space because you can structure the hell out some deals with with the family owned businesses, man. I mean, you know, when they get corporate owned, you you kind of yeah. But but this family owned, you can structure the hell out of some stuff. So that deal died on us uh, mainly because we didn't we couldn't get the extra hundred grand, and we couldn't put any debt. That was another thing. We were doing straight equity. We had the seller carrying the, the debt. It was a sweet deal, man. We just we so just let's talk about that. The seller carrying the debt. When the seller carried the debt, technically they you're partnering up with them. How does that right. work? Yeah, so so essentially just a seller's note, right? So like the bank is the debt, now they're the debt, right? Now, mm-hmm. you know, their position in this capital stack may be lower than what a bank would be, but but it works well, man. I mean, think about it. I think they were carrying almost $2 million. Now, now there's some upside for them to carry that $2 million, right? You got the interest, you got all the stuff, you got, you know, regular payments coming every month, quarter, whatever. Um, but but the benefit, man, is we didn't have to go, like, into any banks or anything. We were just, like, and, and, and kind of hindsight, I probably should have went to one of our mezzanine lenders and said, look, you know, you guys come in and, and, and put a slug, put the rest of this equity in, fill this gap. But I, but I, I didn't, I don't know if the structure would have worked. But anyway, uh, it's great when the sellers are are carrying the note because you just, and then, and then guess what? If, if stuff goes south, right? Mm-hmm. It's easier to go negotiate with that seller. Hey, because he's kind of tough. He now he really needs this thing to work, right? Because yeah. he's like, hold on, I got two million dollars of debt in this business. Yeah. He really needs it to work. And if it goes, if it's things starting to act up, the economy goes bad, things like that, it's easier to negotiate with him directly. Hey, mm-hmm. you know. And then to go deal with your bank. So I love when, when sellers, we actually try now to not have as much bank debt and try to do a, a little more, you know, Let's find seller out. debt. Yeah, yeah. but if we, if we can, you know, we we, we kind of go from there. We, we're looking at, we're, so we're working on a, a, a printed circuit board company up in Arkansas right now. Uh, really nice little business, family owned, about 70 employees, a lot of employees. Um, but I think they want like seven million dollars. It's asset heavy, so we probably can get almost three million dollars straight up off the assets. Then there's the real estate piece that you know. So it's another, there's another good thing about some of these smaller family-owned businesses, and I said this before to you guys, especially to Gerald, mm-hmm. is the sale leaseback function, right? That's interesting in all this deal, all these deals, right? And I'm I don't know if I'm digressing here or if I'm adding to the conversation, but um, typically. A lot of these small businesses, their family, their money is kind of tied up in that real estate, right? They got money in the business, but the real wealth sometimes is in the real estate, right? Mm-hmm. They may own all these buildings. Mm-hmm. And we try to be a value add by bringing in a sale leaseback partner and actually helping them get more, have more liquidity at closing by buying the real estate. Okay. Now, what we typically try to do mm-hmm. is. <clears throat> We typically we will lowball on real estate. Right. I will say that I'm gonna be very candid. We typically will try to lowball on the real estate because mm-hmm. we're looking to capture that delta, right? If they if the real estate is worth a million, we might say, hey, we'll give you eight hundred. We'll give you eight hundred grand, or we we'll give you because what we can do now is take that extra two hundred or three hundred grand and start deleveraging, right? If we got right. debt on the business. Now we can take that and start deleveraging, right? Mm-hmm. Just go ahead and pay 300, 400 grand to the debt, right? And now you're deleveraging. And so that's our three things. Our three things are when we get in the business is number one, uh, uh, margin improvement, right? Can we improve the margins? Mm-hmm. Number two, deleveraging the business, right? Getting mm-hmm. that debt down as much as, as fast mm-hmm. as we can. And then number three, multiple expansion. And so if I can get the real estate for 700 when it's really worth a million, Right. Mm-hmm. I'm going to I'm going to offer you 700. But mm-hmm. the sale lead back team is going to get me a million. You follow what I'm saying? So it's kind of like we do in real estate, like we'll buy it lower, refinance it, take the money out and then do the renovation. Or, or there you go. There you go. See right. what I mean? But I'm just yeah. doing it there. I, they're coming in and and I'm going to the, the sale lead back company is going to get there a million from their investors. But mm-hmm. all I have to turn over is 700 grand. So now there's 300 grand left for us, and now we can yeah take that and 
dump it and deleverage the, the the business a little bit. Makes so anyway, sense. yeah, that's that's that's, that's kind of one of the things we do as well. Nice, nice. All right. So are you adding on any value with um, uh, new contracts or new customers or a new um, area of business for the company? Great question. So, so one of the things that we do, one of our sticks, if you will, is we'd like to find companies that can possibly benefit from our minority status, right? Mm -hmm. Especially corporate clients, right? You think about the landscape today. I don't know how long this is going to last, but mm -hmm. you know, everybody is all about diversity, 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 diversity with our suppliers, diversity with everything, right? So mm -hmm. you think about a printed circuit board manufacturer. Think about that for me. A minority owned printed circuit board manufacturer. Not a lot, right? But if we buy this and we can convert them, guess what? Now we can go to BMW and say, now you, now you have a supplier that's mm -hmm. minority. Now we can go to, I mean, anything you think that's, that, that's, that gets made on a printed circuit board, we can go to every one of those customers. So, yes, we do. If, if, if we can leverage now, that's one way, right? Other than that, I mean, it's just a matter of our operating executives, right? We bring in an executive chair. not They don't come in as CEO. So it's our executive chair that will bring the value out from that uh, standpoint. But when you're talking about enhancing the customer base, being a minority alone, it doesn't guarantee business. So I, I, I'll say that. But being a minority alone, if you find the right business where there is a lack of minority owned companies in that industry or space, then absolutely you, you expand the hell out of the business prospects after that. Um, I give you another one. We're looking at here in Texas. Uh, it is a packaging company. And what do they They package for Procter & Gamble? Like their soaps. Like when you see the soaps in the store, they package that. Mm -hmm. Well, they're not minority led. You you make that business a minority led business with the with the uh, with the manufacturing lines they already have in place and all that. Man, you go to Park and Gamble. Man, you go to. They will love. They they're put it this way. Whether it's lip, whether some of it is lip service, but whether it's because they really want to do it or not, that's not up to me. But they are searching for this diversity within their supply chain. And of course we all know sometimes that just makes the company look better, right? There, there's a marketing piece of that too, but who cares? That has nothing to do with me. That's on them. Mm -hmm. But yes, Elroy, to answer your question, those are some of the ways that we, we attempt to do it. And then it opens up another market too, because there is right. not, is government contracts for minority, That's right? right? So now, you, now you're right. bringing in some government contracts that they That's may right. not have had before, right? That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And, you know, being a minority in the space, I remember when I first got in, and I always knew there was power in just being a minority in the space, right? I understood that, right? But I always had a hard time leading with that, right? Because yeah. I did not want anyone that I was sitting at the table with or sitting with me to write me a check just because I was black. And they thought because of the black thing that we could, you know, we could make, you know, something. No, you wrote a check because I'm intelligent. You wrote a check because of equal business stature. You wrote a check, you know. And so I used to I used to battle with that a little bit when I first got started. But now I'm kind of like, okay, I see, I see it, I get it, I understand it. And I just kind of, you know, we you, you kind of roll a little bit. But I did battle with that at first. But if it's it, if it's an advantage, then you know, you try to figure out all the yeah advantages you can you can use and go with. It. What's your unique advantage? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. And that's cool, man. Um. So, if if there's a company, let me ask you this, because I, I, I there's a company that I wanna I wanna own, right? Uh -huh. I don't know if these these guys probably not interested in selling, right? How would I get them to sell to me? What what would you suggest? How do I approach that? Okay, so you're talking proprietary. Just, right. So I just want the company because I see what they're doing, 
well, it's two companies, right? There's one company I want because they technology. I like how they're building out their technology. I like their R&D department. And I know over time, this company is going to be incredible, right? And then there's a, another company that I want because they got a sick sales team. So I just want, I just want all, I, this is a talent acquisition, really. You know what I'm saying? Sure, I just want sure. to buy a company because, you know, they have something like 7,000 salespeople working in the company. Right. 7,000 salespeople automatically pushing our product. Even if one person, <laughs> 7,000 sales a month is nice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. how do you come, I guess the, my real question is how do I take my need to acquire the company and turn it into something real and make it happen? Yeah, so you, you know, you're talking proprietary outreach and things like that. Um, if there's no pain, right? If there's no pain, it's a little more difficult, right? If you, you know, they already, you know, the only thing I would suggest, and that it doesn't even have to be any pain, but typically if there's a pain point, like, think, like, so the opportunities, I think, you know, and that's what I tell you guys, if you, if there's power in like data and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There, there is, uh, and if you send me an email, I'm waiting on, uh, so mm -hmm. one of my investors just introduced me to their associate. told me about the bank. I cannot think of it. Anyway, there's a ton of money because of uh, because of COVID. There's a ton of money that the government lent, you know, these businesses. And now these businesses are in search like they're they're over levered on their balance sheets and things like that. I, I can when we get done with this, just please remind me. Say, hey, what's that list that you were talking about? Because what I'm getting at here and I, I'm, I might be digressive. I get I'm getting back to your point. What I'm getting at here when I say pain. Right. There's a list of all these companies that have this pain. Right. They need to figure out how to, they need a, they need a partner, right? Because they've got too much debt on the, on the, on the uh, balance sheet because COVID and they gave them, they had all that money. So that, that's, that's an easy sale. Hey, I can come in and I can help you with that pain, right? I got equity. I can bring some equity. We take over, you know, 40% of the business, yada, yada, yada. You look at what we do from a minority perspective and acquiring minority led businesses as well. What's the pain there? Well, the pain there is that unless someone of a minority comes in and acquires them, it will be hard for them to exit, therefore hard to have a liquidity event in their business, which is really what drives the wealth, right? And so those are those are examples of pain. And when I what I mean when I say you're going after something that you really want, that's a pain you can you can leverage. In your case, to me, it's just more about getting the know the owner. I <laughs> get you know that's the only thing that I, I mean from a simplistic standpoint, getting to know the owner and and you know, hell, if you figured out, look, everything is for sale, right? right. Everything. You just got to have the figured, right price. <laughs> yeah, if you figured out that, hey, this business is actually worth X and you offer them something like, you know, you could just. So I would say that there would be two things. Number one, just getting to know whoever that owner, that CEO is. Uh, number one. And number two, remember, everything is for sale, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a cold call. Uh, email if you got the email hey i'm interested in learning more about your business um you know I, I think what you're doing is valuable do you have any interest you have any interest you know what this is always great yeah. do you have any interest of in taking any chips off the table most people most people love mm -hmm. taking some chips off the table <laughs> right yeah. cash it, get cash today right yeah most people money most off the people table. Will, less money yeah. out of them. <laughs> bingo Bingo. So that could be something like you could just leave. Well, hey, would you have any interest in taking some chips off the table? I think this is interesting. And so and, and, and most people will perk up and say, well, well, yeah, I'm always interested or or no, nah, not at the moment. But I think most people are always interested in taking some chips off the table. Yeah. So anyway, that's a couple of ways that so, I would kind of approach it. So let me ask you this, because you said 40 percent just now. Often when you acquire a company, do you go in for the 51 percent or it uh, you'll take a low percentage. No, so we so all of our companies, when we structure everything, we structure it with an equity role. Equity role is anywhere between 20 25 percent. So we're buying either 75 or 80 percent of it. So majority control, yes, but not 100 percent. All right. We, we we like those we like those owners to stay in stay in with us. You know, take some chips off the day, have a second bite at the apple, maybe five years from down the road or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that's nice. All right. 
Yeah, I remember you talked about that before, where you want the owners to stay in because they have the expertise to run the business and makes it easier transitioning uh, to this new plan. And just how extensive is, is your plan for the company? Are you restructuring? What what are you doing with the company? Then? Um, you mean as far as operations or you just mean as far as? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so we, we, we're operationally focused. So we do have a process improvement plan that we implement in every company. Right. That just kind of we're looking to improve the process. Typically, most of our companies, it, a lot of times we like to see when the owner is kind of more passively in the business and not active in the business. So that tells us there's a CEO, there's something like that. That means we can just bring an executive chair, right? So that's one of the things that we do. We try to find an executive chair or if we, you know, we typically may have one that has the experience in whatever space it is. So for instance, this, this printed circuit board manufacturer, well, well, we need someone that's an executive chair that may have some, some experience in supply chain, right? Cause that's a big supply chain thing. Um, and then we just kind of start improving the process. So it typically goes like this, uh, controller, right? It's, it's simple stuff we do, right? That, that, that's, that everyone is doing, right? You know, you bring in a controller, clean up the financials, establish some KPIs, you improve the process and then you focus on sales, right? You focus on sales and, and generate more income. That's typically the three-step process that we go through. Executive chair, controller, process, sales. So the executive chair is sort of over the CEO. That's different. Yeah. Great question. Let me tell you something, man. Tell you something. I was with one of our investors. He said, hey, he said, he said, hey, your differentiation, you need to think about you need an executive chair. And he said to me, he said, now, now, now this guy, he used to be the CEO of Pizza Hut. He's one of our investors. He's a great guy. Um, he he said to me, he said, do you know the difference between the CEO and the executive chair? And I was like, no. And so, Elroy, so I'm glad you're asking this, man. This is great stuff, right, that we need to talk about. So the CEO runs the company. The executive chair is more like the coach, right? Mm -hmm. They deal with the CEO on a daily. They're not in the company, but they're more like the coach. Now, in the corporate world, right, the executive chair is the old CEO that's phasing out while the new CEO comes in. In our world, the executive chair works within the company not within the company, but with directly with the CEO and has experience in that particular industry. And so, cause you got to remember what we're doing is we're taking the small, this family owned business that was started by my grandpa in the backwoods or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And he has no college. He has no business real acumen, but he knew how to get this. He knew he understood this business. Mm -hmm. Well, you bring somebody that now has, the pedigree, the degree, the come from the corporate world, and you begin to parachute them or have them tied to that type of operation. Well, well, talent-wise, it's back to what you said, Devon, and y'all were talking about talent. Talent-wise, we've just improved that business tremendously because we've enhanced the, the 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 talent of the business by having that executive chair. And so that's, that's what cool. the difference between the CEO and executive chair is in a sense. I was about to ask you, what's the difference between the executive chair and a board? But uh, when you really think, I'm um, thinking when you're thinking about these small business, they probably don't have boards. So, so we do. So great mm -hmm. question, right? Again, we do. We, mm -hmm. so out. So when we buy a company, we typically get a board seat. Our lenders may get a board seat. Right. And then, you know, and so that's, so there is a board. No, there is absolutely a board, but the executive chair is directly working. And the executive chair could be on our board too, but he's directly working with that CEO, maybe talking to him three or four times a week. Maybe, you know what I mean? Just that's, that's his whole thing with that CEO. Because it's he, about people. He's it's the new performance people. coach. <laughs> that's Devon, there you go. There you go. He's helping guide that shit. He's helping the CEO understand, see things that he may not have even thought of. Helping him work through the, the the plans logistically. I mean, it's it's a it's a great you know it's a great dynamic to have. And actually, I got that. So again, a lot of this stuff is because I got investors that are in the space, and they they've got like they may have a hundred million dollar funds and things like that. And they tell me like, well, 
I'm like, well, what do y'all do different? And they're like, well, we got this executive chair. And then they'll tell me, you should consider executive chair. And I'm like, well, what the hell is executive chair? Do you do? And I'm like, you ever right? And then all of a sudden, I'm like, ah, that's it. That's another piece of the pie. So, so I, I'm just telling you, I'm just every the more and more people we talk to, the more and more curious you are. You're like, oh, I'm gonna take that piece and take that piece, and I'm going to take what they do as a hundred million dollar firm and bring it down to what we do, and then yeah, you know, and then yeah, yeah. But that's why I like having these conversations because a lot of information is basically having conversations with people or picking up a book or whatever. And, and a lot of times our people just avoid these conversations. You know, I was talking to this young lady. Hey, Devon, it's, com it's complex, Devon. <laughs> it's complex, man. I'm telling you. It's scary. I'm telling you, I used to do that, but it's scaring people away, man. If you start, think about what we just all this stuff we just said. Right. You're like, oh man, now I got to find the business, I got to finance the business, I got to value the business. Then when you close it, I got to I got to <laughs> had to make sure the people are right. I gotta make sure. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. I think it's part of mindset, right? Because a person like me hear that and I get excited. I think let's see what's let's this is, sounds like fun, you know what I'm saying? Right. So let's yes. see what's the fun in this. Let, let's see and, and you know what? how we can do this. How can we structure the you know what I'm and Devon, let me tell you something, man. I, I asked my I asked my son this the other day. I said, Hey, I've got a um I've got a uh, a six year old and I got a ten year old. Okay. Mm -hmm. I asked my son this. I said, Hey. Why won't you play against the 10 year old? Why won't you play basketball against him? He said, it's too easy. I said, so you're telling me that you naturally want a challenge. He was like, yeah. I was like, everybody in life naturally wants challenge. Mm -hmm. Nobody always like stuff that's easy. It's not, it's not fun. It's not okay. fun when you finally get it. This is what I'm doing is an absolute challenge. That's what makes it so much fun when we get it done. Absolutely. Absolutely. You got to challenge yourself. You got to challenge your mind. You know, just thinking on another level is it's exciting. You know, I'm yeah. Like, yeah, it's fun and exciting, man. It's fun. Yeah. Sitting in front of folks, trying to convince them to cough up millions of dollars. That's fun. <laughs> that's, exactly. fun that's fun to me. That's fun to me. You know, and, and they may say no, but man, it's fun. It's but fun. you already accept you're going to get more no's than you're going to get yes. Right. So that's already out the window. Right. You know what I'm saying? Hey, look, hey, look. Listen, when you get them to say yes and you walk right there, you're like, yes. Yeah, yeah. Hey, the, the biggest the biggest retailer in the world, Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, I think he pitched that thing 65 times, man. Mm -hmm. 65. 65 times he had to pitch it. And mm -hmm. so part of, part, of the, part of the beast, man, part of the business, man. Yeah, man, that's fun. Get, Look at your yeah, man. Help you, help you grow. Help you get this that open the st studios in Atlanta. Oh, Tyler uh, Perry. Tyler Perry, yeah. Right. He yeah. pitched. He pitched all his ideas to a thousand times before the first person said, "Hey, I'll give you a shot." The late he's like, "Yeah, I went to all these studios. They yeah. are, now the man owns the biggest studio on the yeah. East Coast. You know what yeah. I'm saying?" Like right. part, like I've already accepted that as part of the game. You're gonna get a lot of people just can't. There was a saying. Um, they say the interviewer was interviewing this 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 lady Helen Keller, and they she, they said you're blind, but you've achieved so much. How did you accomplish that? And Helen Keller turns to her and says, um, "I lot of really blind." with vision than to have um, sight and no vision because That's a lot right. of people have sight but they can't see past their nose right they That's can't right. see what you're about to turn this company into right That's so they, right. they no 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 I don't want to put my money in no and that's just it's 90 percent I feel like it's 90 percent of the people yeah. so you know, it's like looking for a needle in the haystack you're looking for that one percent, ten percent, whatever you want to call it, and it's gonna take some work. And people don't working like time. <laughs> working time, buddy. Working yeah. time, man. Yeah, working time. What's up, Elroy? Almost time to get out of here. Talk to me. Yeah, no, I just wanted um to 
thank Jafar for uh, really, you know, being open and frank and um, telling us some things because access to information is one of the ways that they keep us from being able to do things. We may have the vision, but not the opportunity. And mm -hmm. uh, you need that opportunity. And uh, when someone opens a door, uh, like you, you know, you have a door open for yourself, you know, and you, you let others through, that's great. And I think that's what you're doing by, you know, telling us and sharing um, this information with, you know, our public. So thank you. Thank you, sir. And yeah. Anytime. I love talking to you, Javar, because I always learn something new. My mind is always stressed, and I'm sure the people that's listening, they're going to also have the same experience because you're passionate about what you do, and it comes through, you know, so yeah. absolutely. Anytime you brothers, I always said it, anytime you brothers need me to do whatever, yeah. please, absolutely. please, I'll, 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 I am more than happy to do it. I told y'all what I'm in it for is exposing Absolutely. people. Y'all just let me know. Absolutely. I'll make it happen. Nothing has changed about that. Mm -hmm. It's just keep growing slowly but surely. Like you said, time. <laughs> it's just a matter of time before everybody hear it. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But thanks again, brother. We we All over right. that one hour mark, and we're going to do this again soon. All right? Let me know. All right, brother. I have a lot.